very, very warm welcome to you all uh, to celebrate this marvellous collection of women's writing in many languages, Arabic above all, but also French, um, and I think others as well, um, that has been put together, edited by Selma Dabar, and features the writers we are going to be hearing today, whom Wen Chi is going to introduce in, in absolute, in properly. And I'm just going to say a few general things, which is that this is part of the series Arabic stories and poetry and translation, which we've been running for quite a number of years, in fact, between SOAS and Birkbeck. And I think this is our first baby because this book <laughs> was inspired <laughs> by some of the writers whom who we invited to the series of seminars and Selma was a regular attender. And so I feel personally very proud, and I think Wen Chin does too, that one of the, the, one of the aims and intentions and the whole spirit of the seminar series was that we should open readers' appreciation and pleasure in the whole range of writing from the Middle East, which somehow had been siloed, if you like, through many problems that all of you are aware of, but actually also through the disciplinary structures of universities, which tend to keep comparative literature in one corner, the language, languages in another corner, and oriental studies in another corner. And the, there is very little actual dialogue and com comparative work, even though, as you all know, our cultures have been deeply tangled for a very long time and continue to be so. And the other aspect of this wonderful collection, which um, we feel kind of close to, is that we very much wanted to in, in, listen to the voices of women from the past and the present, because that is an area where probably the worst ignorance still grips um, the public consciousness. And so this anthology, I think, very much helps to shift and change those entrenched attitudes. So now I'm going to hand over to Wen Chin, to, um, who will introduce our wonderful speakers tonight. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome again. I'll, I'll introduce our speakers to today or this evening in the order of their appearance, so that I, I don't interrupt the flow of the reading, and you you can just you know listen and enjoy the reading. So uh, Selma Dabba. Uh, who will introduce the anthology and speak a little bit about it, is a British-Palestinian writer. She has lived in Bahrain, Cairo, Kuwait, Jeddah, Grenoble, and Jerusalem, and now she lives in London. Her short stories have been published by Granta, Wasafiri, Saki, and International Pen. They have also been in a number of Saki anthologies for such short stories by Palestinian women and as well as the things I would tell you, British Muslim women write. She has also written for stage and screen. She has written a play for BBC Radio 4. The Brick was nominated for an Emerson Award. She has written a futuristic play, play set in Palestine in 2048, Sleep It Off, Dr. Scott, produced by WDR in Germany. Her first novel, Out of It, and I recommend that you read it, was set between Gaza, London, and the Gulf, and was a Guardian Book of the Year. She's the editor of We Wrote in Symbols, Love and Lust by Arab Women Writers, which just came out recently. And Samira Negrush, one of the the, the, the poets anthologized in We Wrote in Symbols is a doctor, poet, and translator from Algiers. Her poetry has been translated into 20, more than 20 languages, and she has frequently collaborated with visual artists, choreographers, and musicians. Her books include Alomar de Grenade, right? Six Arabes de Fortune Autour de Ma Banoir, and traces, right, between scrolls and sketches included in We Wrote in Symbols, Love and Lust by Arab Women Writers, were translated by Marilyn Hacker, who and was published in bilingual editions, the Olive, Olive Trees, Jazz, and other poems. And Marilyn Hacker is the author of 14 books of poems, including Blazons and A Stranger's Mirror, and an essay collection on authorized voices. She has under her belt 18 translations of French and Francophone poets, includes Venus Khoury, 
got us a handful of blue earth and John, the, I don't know how to read it, that that lead on, she received 2010 uh, Vogue Award and the International Organa Prize of Poetry from the Beta Shah um, by Hanan Sheikh. And Hanan Sheikh is a celebrated and award winning novelist, play journalist, and storyteller from Lebanon. Her books available in English translation include I Sweep the Sun Off Rooftops, Women of Sand and Myrrh, 2001 Nights, and The Occasional Version. Her word has been translated in 20 languages. In June 2019, a sheikh made a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. And Emily Seeloff, right, is a senior lecturer in medieval Arabic language and literature at the University of Exeter. Her early research focused on the figure of the uninvited or party crasher in medieval Arabic literature. And especially the 11th century work, Hikayat Abil Qasim, the subject of her monograph, Hikayat Abil Qasim, A Literary Banquet. She co edited and translated this text with Professor Hertian van Gelder. Her translation of another 11th century book of party crashers is titled Selections from the Art of Pat Party Crashing in Medieval Iraq. She recently edited a co authored textbook to introduce beginning students to the city of medieval Baghdad. Baghdad at the center of the world, eight to 13 centuries, and has also created a collection of cartoons titled Popeye and Curly, 120 days in medieval Baghdad to accompany this textbook. So please give a warm welcome to our speakers and I'll turn the podium to Selma. Hello, hi, can everyone hear me? I hope so. Okay. Thank you very much, Marina Wenchen. It's wonderful to be here and to see you all and for you to join us. I have some slides which I'm going to um, share. So this, um, my anthology, which um, came out in April, was something I was working on throughout lockdown, but its inspiration came, a lot of the inspiration for it came through the Arabic stories and poetry and translation workshops that I intended. Also um, other workshops connected to the Library of Arabic Literature and some of the work that that exposed me to and conversations with Marina Warner. Um, also going on um, being part of the uh, Stories in Transit project. Um, what I, how I put this idea together, the, the, the idea for it sort of winged at me from lots of different angles, but was um, connected to me being a, a writer myself, I'd found that I'd had two conversations, one with a journalist when I was up in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival, who was, who covers mainly Arabic literature, and he said, look, it doesn't matter how much I enjoy Arabic literature, I find it very difficult to, to get my friends to read any of it that just the assumptions connected to it are that it's heavy and it's political and it's it's sort of downbeat so i was thinking well you know how 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 can that be changed that was one thing and the other was a kind of curiosity from talking to a publicity manager at, at bloomsbury when i was publishing my first book and he was saying that he often said to people when they wanted to publish books like go out and live because you haven't lived yet you're a fresh graduate and i was thinking that there's this kind of irony in the way that a lot of the writers from the Arab world have almost lived too much. They've lived so fully. So there's so many events in their life. And if you look at the women in this anthology, they're really, they, they really showcase that very well. Most of them, like Samira here, is, is a doctor. They have professions and they write and they're creative. They write in many different forms. Some of them are also activists in their personal life. So they have political voices, they're journalists, they're incredibly multifaceted individuals with so much to tell but how that's getting through is, is difficult the other issue which is one which is everyone is interested in is is love lust, sex it's it's just one of these um you know is a very strong primordial impulse which has gone throughout history and i had um read um the anthology classical poems by arab women which had voices from the classical period and they were really surprising to me in the way that that women's sexuality was described by women themselves at a very early period in time some of them going back to say 3000 bc in the jahiliya period where they are sort of asserting themselves without a 
necessarily a sort of provocative approach, but just a very self-centered and quite spirited um, attitude towards these things. And then you've got this, this sort of huge grouping of, of, of stereotypes about the region and other books written about women and sexuality and the Arab world. And it's always phrased along the lines of a problematic. So I was trying to get away from that by showing Arabs women's writing in, in its own voice, not in, in a more creative way. And Marina was saying earlier with regards to, she was talking about a form in poetry and, and the creativity that sometimes constraints can bring about. And it's, it's kind of the same thing for writers dealing with a subject matter, which is so, so fused with external, um, uh, uh, external constraints, external expectations, and one's own personal sense of, of shame. So I think that it, it was partly the idea of how, how these, um, how, how these writers responded to that. So I put together these are my writers. Um, in the end, I have about, there are about 75 writers here from the classical period and the contemporary period. Some write in Arabic, some in English, and some in French. Um, so I was heavily reliant on the incredibly crafted work of translators to um, make these works fresh and to identify other writers who may have been under my radar. Some of these writers have been translated into English for the first time. Some are very well known, like Samia Issa in the Arab world as a journalist and as a novelist, but hasn't been translated previously. Um, some of these writers, I'm looking at Malika Mustadraf at the moment, have almost been single-handedly um, discovered and, and resurrected by uh, her translator, Alice Guthrie. Others are very well established and readers in English might have heard of them. Um, Ahtaf Swaif, um, Hanan al-Sheikh will be joining us later, Huda Barakat, uh, Natalie Handal. Uh, these are people who've, who've won multiple awards for their writing and are featured here with, with other writers who came in to me through an open call that I issued for new writers, so that writers who hadn't been able to get into the mainstream were able to submit their work in English, Arabic or French for us to um, pick five of those to include with these other more established writers. Um, next thing I just um, to pass on to some of the points that I've, I, I made uh, you're on my introduction <laughs> um but it's yeah it's just i think something i felt increasingly more pas passionately about is the necessity for better storytelling to come out of the arab world to, to break up some of the stereotypes and having worked in genre with screenwriting at the moment you've got a, a deluge of um stories coming into the Arab world from outside through Netflix and other online streaming mechanisms, which often have fairly negative depictions of the Arab world. And of all of the screenwriters in the US, I heard recently at a Sundance Festival that it's only about 0.4% of men and women from the whole Middle East Arab region who are um, script writing. So there's an absence of storytelling by people from, from the region. And then another point I want to make, which isn't directly connected, but I think that there's something very interesting about the whole um, genre of writing about the erotic in terms of the way that fantasy uh, functions as a way where it's often placed in a different setting, where the characters are able to to lose inhibition and to move into a different space. It's seen as a, to, to move, to transfer one's locality is, or in one's imagination is seen as a liberation. And I find that in this era of, of walls and, and closing down on one's sort of national identities as, as something very positive, this idea of exploration, bringing about greater freedoms. Quick word about my, my publisher because I think they've been really amazing and instrumental in terms of my 
development of my thoughts on, on this project was that Saki has, has been publishing work, um, is a secular Arab space in London. It's the oldest um, Arab publishing house here. It's published several really groundbreaking books by women writers, by Palestinian writers. Um, it's, it's published works on sexuality and Islam and on female um, singers. So that it was a natural inclination for me to, to go to this publishing house with this idea of like how do we combine the classical voices with these contemporary voices because it seemed to me that the contemporary voices were getting increasingly daring and outspoken and creative um, in the last 20 to 30 years and to show how you've had this, this sort of build up of, of, of women's voices talking about um, issues of sexuality and of lust um, through the Jahaliya, Abbas, Umayyad, Abbasid, Andalusian period, and then this, this sort of period of about 500 years where very little is written, and then it building up again after that. Um, so in terms of selection, I wanted to keep it very broad. I think diversity was one of my main um, motivators. So I have all the three religions included. I was trying to get as many locations as possible. Um, a lot of the writers are not based in the Arab world, the contemporary writers. Um, some are not of Arab ethnicity. Um, there was a variety of sexualities. The languages, as I mentioned, also change. The styles and the voices are also very, very different. The audiences, if you can ever sort of anticipate who an audience the writers are speaking to, can vary, but that's a matter of conjecture for the really for the writer to assess themselves and um, their level of experience. Um, it's all of it, all of the work within this collection is fictive. Uh, I would say the only non-fictive piece we're going to hear from Emily Seelove later on was her letter of Zadmir. Um, and the other thing that I was trying to find a way of doing is finding contemporary writers who hook back to older um, classical periods in their writing. And Salwa Al-Naimi does this with references to um, uh, Ibn Arabi and Yasmin Seal also does that. So there's this kind of, this talking back to periods of greater liberality and history and history seen as a way of, a possible sort of way of guiding uh, the future so that ideas of um, female liberation, sexual liberation, if it's seen to be an essential component of political liberation, it's not just seen as an ex an, an import from outside, it's it's something that is more organic in a, in a way. And um, and then it just the questions I've often asked is about how, how things were ordered, um, how, how we actually put them together in the end. It's quite unusual in that we don't attach the biographies or the dates of the pieces to the work so that the works can speak to each other. And I had a really lovely review in the um, Times Literary Supplement this week where they were talking about how the, the voices seem to whisper to each other across the across the era, which is exactly what we were trying to achieve because we felt that some of the characters, whatever era they came from, could talk to each other very well or they were coming from the same position of experience or outlook. And, um, and also so many of the pieces, I'm saying this in a very deadpan way, but a lot of the pieces are very funny and um, humor was, was a big part of it. Um, yeah. And then just um, last slide, I feel I'm running out of time, just to show that there's a whole variety of settings with, within the book, from beaches to Andalusia in the medieval era to ca cafes in Paris and Abbasid courts, which of the world of which could be found in, in books like Consorts of the Caliphs. Um, and it's just a very, um, I see it as a book that you dip into, you read a piece, you read the biography, because the biographies I'm as proud of as, as the pieces themselves. And then you read the book with or without knowledge of the writer because the, the works stand on their own. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Selma. Hmm. Um, 
So, uh, do you, Marina, do, do you and Samira want to go first now? Because Marilyn can't make it. So we were thinking of having Emily first and then Samira and um, uh, uh, Marilyn afterwards. Uh, so uh, would that be okay? Or would Samira and you like to go first? Is there a chance that, Mar Hannah, is there a chance Marilyn will be able to get onto the Zoom? I think we shouldn't, I don't think we should change things at this point. Okay. So, let's, let's, so, so this is Samira Negrush. Mm -hmm, yes. Would you, like to, would you like to start reading? And I will stand in to read Marilyn Hacker's translations. Um, we're very, very okay. sorry that there's been a technical hitch and Marilyn Hacker in Paris isn't yet able to get on Zoom. If she does, she can pick up. So Samira, over to you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm sorry Marilyn can't make it. She has uh, technical troubles. So first of all, I would like to thank you Selma for this uh, great anthology. Uh, the presentation was uh, said a lot about, uh, about it, but uh, I would add that I'm really happy to be part of it. It's really difficult to, to do a work uh, based on this region that is very difficult to, uh, to read and to understand. Uh, very complex, uh, and I have to say that uh, you brought us the, uh, this region for what it is uh, and uh, what it has always been, like a plural, a plural place, uh, multi-confessional and multicultural, and I think it's very important to, to say this uh, nowadays, uh, where identity is becoming more and more, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, a point of trouble and uh, and maybe also violence in uh, in our country and also uh, in the occident in uh, in Europe. So thank you very much. And I especially like the way you organize the the texts, uh, not uh, chronological or or not um, alphabetical. Uh, it, it's like reading a, bo a book uh, read by one person and. Basically, it has been written by you. There is a flow, and it's very pleasant to, to, to read it as a whole. So thank you very much for doing all this work for all of us. I will be reading a text from uh, uh, The Olive Trees Jazz, translated by Marilyn Hacker. Um, uh, first, it will be um, fragments from Café Sans Sucre, Café No Sugar, and then uh, in, Invent to invent the word, inventer le verbe. Ce sera une, une lecture euh, sans interruption. Il y a des pages sans écriture qui vous traversent au bout de la nuit, celles qu'un éditeur n'attend pas et qui sont le chemin vers un livre imaginaire que vous regardez s'éloigner, à mesure que le temps passe, vous préférez penser qu'il est à jamais dans la mémoire morte de l'ordinateur. There are pages, no writing on them, that go across you in the middle of the night. Pages that no editor waits for, that are the road towards an imaginary book you watch moving further away as time passes. You would prefer to think it was in your computer's dead memory forever. J'aime boire le café avec un nuage de crème. Faux, j'aime le café sans rien, sans sucre. Je n'aime que le nuage brumeux de l'aube que je surprends avant le sommeil. Il se glisse et comble silencieusement les creux des collines. J'aime ce filet de crème sur lequel je traverse du sein, au téton. I like to drink coffee with a cloud of cream. Not true. I like coffee with nothing, no sugar. I only like the hazy cloud of dawn that I catch out before sleeping. It slides in and silently fills the hills hollow. I like that thread of cream I cross from breast to nipple. Elle m'a servi une eau douteuse dans un bol couleur de terre. Elle dit, j'ai écrit un roman, mais la disquette ne marche plus. Elle dit, regarde mon champ d'olivier. J'ai toujours rêvé d'avoir un verger. 
je descends les trois marches, je regarde au loin quelques mauvaises herbes incendiées par le soleil, un citronnier bétonné comme un pilier aveugle, je dis « il est beau ton champ d'olivier, change de marque, de disquette ». She served me dubious water in an earth-colored bowl. She said, I've written a novel, but this floppy disk stopped working. She said, look at my field of olive trees. I've always dreamed of having an orchard. I go down the three steps. I look into the distance, a few weeds burned by the sun, a lemon tree surrounded by concrete like a blind pillar. I said, your olive orchard is beautiful. Get another brand of floppy disk. Une, deux. Je compte les gouttes qui tombent du ciel sur le bout de plastique insolent qui traîne sur le balcon. Trois, quatre. Toutes les pensées sont bonnes à chasser. Quand rien ne vient, ni désir, ni sommeil, je cherche une cigarette du coin de l'œil et je ne fume même pas. One, two, I count the drops falling from the sky on the rag of plastic lying insolently on the balcony. Three, four, every thought only worth driving away when nothing comes, not desire or sleep, out of the corner of my eye, I search for a cigarette and I don't even smoke. Encore cette main qui tremble, et presse à peine le stylo vulgaire sur une grille de mots croisés. Le piano reste fermé et poussiéreux. Le poète est une ombre craintive, sur un fauteuil déchu, face au lampadaire éteint d'une mosquée endormie, et rêve au jour qui se lèvera sans lui. That hand trembling again as it tentatively presses the, bana the banal ballpoint on a crossword puzzle grid. The piano stays closed and dusty. The poet, a timid shadow on a dilapidated armchair, facing the extinguished lamp of a sleeping mosque, dreams of day that will break without her. Je dis, pour écrire les choses les plus banales, il faut d'abord écrire sa naissance de la mère, du père, de l'amour, du corps, des femmes, des hommes, du violeur et des assassins, de l'inceste et du doute, de la nuit et de la faim, du désert, des livres, de la jalousie, du soupçon, du sexe, des ruines, de la mer, des arbres, de l'archéologie, des dieux grecs et païens et des étoiles, je dis, tout cela est presque banal avant et après écrire. I said to write the most ordinary things. You must first write your birth, about your mother, your father, about the body, women, men, the rapist, the assassins, incest, about night, about doubt, the desert, hunger, books, jealousy, suspicion, sex, ruins, the sea, trees, archaeology, Greek and pagan gods, and about the stars. I said all that is almost ordinary before and after writing. J'aime cette place de la comédie où les acteurs abondent d'eux et vers la ligne une du tram. Je sirote un verre d'un quelconque liquide qui s'est réchauffé entre mes mains et j'attends la tombée de la nuit. Je fais mon théâtre au milieu des silhouettes libres et assurées. J'accuse le choc culturel et j'en vis. Une certaine insouciance. I like that place de la comédie, where actors throng from and to the number one tram line. I sip a glass of indeterminate liquid, warming between my hands, and I wait for nightfall. I make my own theater in the midst of these free and confident shadows. I blame culture shock, and I envy a certain insouciance. Parfois, je pense qu'il faut larguer les amarres, vite prendre le premier bateau, le premier avion, le premier n'importe quoi. Juste partir les bras ballants, le cœur solitaire, avec le sentiment que le monde est immense. Je traverse le boulevard du port, 
J'entends le bateau aboyer, me tenter, me distraire. Je manque d'écraser un passant et je me dis qu'Alger est une sacrée putain. Sometimes I think I ought to break loose from all moorings fast, take the first boat, the first plane, the first no matter what, but leave arms swinging solitary heart with the feeling that the world is immense. I cross the boulevard of the port, hear the boat barking, trying to distract me. I almost run over a pedestrian, and I say to myself that Algiers is one hell of a haul. Je veux bien croire que l'avenir soit amer depuis qu'il faut des photos millimétriquement convenables sur fond blanc cramoisi pour traverser la Méditerranée et un vélo d'appartement pour s'assouplir le tendon d'Achille en attendant que les espaces verts soient aérés par une rotation bisextile et les forêts défrichées par les faux incendies de juillet. I can well believe that the future is bitter now that you need biometric photos with white and crimson background to cross the Mediterranean and an exercise bike to relax the Achilles tendon while waiting for the green spaces to be aerated by a bisextile rotation and the forests cleared by July's false fires. Ce qui prédispose à la rencontre, ce sont parfois ces quatre vents qui se télescopent sur un nid d'aigle et l'instant d'un mot d'amour annule les forces d'opposition. What makes an encounter likely sometimes, those four winds mingling over an eagle's nest, and the moment of a love word nullify the forces of opposition. Je ne sais pas qui de toi ou de moi est arrivé en premier en attrapant l'autre par le bout de la chemise. De voir venir ou être attendu de toi est un même reflet du miroir. I don't know which of us, you or me, got there first, seizing the other by her shirt tails to see you coming or know you wait for me is the same mirrored reflection. Tu fredonnes toujours cet air innocent quand tes joues rougissent le soir à la moiteur des mains qui se rencontrent et je laisse la marée apporter son refrain. You always hum that innocent tune when your cheeks turn red in the evening, the hands that sweat when they meet, and I let the tide bring its own refrain. Ne t'ai-je pas rencontré au bout d'un escalier sans, sans ascenseur et d'un cœur sans exercice À quoi aurais-je pu m'entraîner pour ne pas tomber à genoux sur le seuil de ta porte Didn't I meet you after climbing a staircase No elevator there and a heart that had no exercise What workout could I have done not to fall on my knees at your threshold. Il y a dans le verbe poème l'idée de te fuir et de me perdre. Quand le jour se lève, quand le jour s'endort, celle de te faire des discours sur la solitude des mots et la liberté de la chair. Il y a dans ce même verbe de poème celui de baisser les voiles et de t'aimer sans retenue. In the verb poem, there's the idea of fleeing from you and losing myself at daybreak, at dusk, and of making speeches to you on the solitude of words and the liberty of the flesh. There is, in the same verb poem, the idea of lowering the sails and loving you without restraint. J'aime imaginer qu'il y a sur le long du quai un train qui finit par arriver et s'arrêter doucement dans le crissement d'un langage parlé par deux êtres qui s'attendent d'un même lointain et se croisent à la veille d'un recommencement après s'être soigneusement chevauchés sur des infinis conditionnels. I have to imagine a train arriving the length of the station platform 
that at last comes gently to a halt in the scratching of a language spoken by two beings who wait for each other in the same far away and who meet by chance on the eve of a fresh start after having carefully straddled an infinity of conditionals. Le corps que j'aime n'aime pas que je me couche tard, que je me lève tôt. Les yeux que j'aime sont presque patients devant le jour qui tarde à s'éclairer. Ils me regardent franchir ma boussole lunaire et s'éveillent à la ligne fantôme de nos rêves superposés. The body I love doesn't love my going to bed late, my getting up early. The eyes I love are almost patient when daylight is, daylight is tardy. They watch me go beyond my lunar compass and awake at the phantom border of our superimposed dreams. Thank you so much, Marina. I'm so sorry I couldn't, you know, we couldn't hear Marilyn read her lovely, luminous translations of your beautiful work. Is it all from Café Sans Sucre? No, it's, oh. uh, uh, I prepared a, a reading where, where, where I put, uh, I created like a story. Yes. With, with the fragments yes. I chose from two different sections. Yes, very beautiful. Especially for this event. Yeah, beautiful. Well, maybe there'll be time for questions if people want to later. Of course, with pleasure. Yes, so thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thanks. I think we now have Hanan Asher. This is one trick of many which my narrator, who narrated my short story, Cupid complaining to Venus, has tried to find a lover who would satisfy her. Later, when my lover whom I love wanted me to have a glass of wine with him, I refused. I told him there was a magnetic force in my blood pulling my energies down between my legs, while wine went to my head, and I wanted all the ecstasy for the black lace at the center, the focus of all feelings, crude and sublime. The moment I found myself underneath the man whom I love and who loves me, I spread my legs just like a crab. If crabs kept their legs together, they wouldn't be able to move around and find food. To put it bluntly, they would die. But my lover bundled me up and returned me to the fetal position. I was squeezing my eyelashes tight shut. He'd once said they were like fans, so that I couldn't see what my heart was feeling. I couldn't believe that one of my ears, which he had said, where a sweet and tempting as cotton candy could be pressed so hard against the pillow, while the other strained to hear a single passionate word. When my arm went numb under the weight of my body, I tried in vain to extricate it with the other arm. To counter my disillusion, I tried to convince myself that I should be satisfied with feeling the way I did about my thighs. Letting my mind wander, I pictured them as two smooth slopes that the traveler had to climb in order to find the Venus flytrap, the welcoming flower that would give him squeezing, sucking kisses, and spread its nectar around about him. My thoughts must have given me the energy to turn toward my lover, not to complain this time, but to offer him my face, or to be more exact, my nose, the one out of all the body's orifices through which the spirit enters and leaves. This was to remind him that when we slept together, it was like a continuation of our whispered conversations, our shared smell, the looks we gave each other. The whole of him had to enter me, not just a part of him, enter me holding the thread of water that would irrigate every corner of me, all that is me, my heart, 
which wants and desires him, and my mind likewise. Two bodies and one soul, or two, two souls and one body. So I stretched before him like a cat, but as always he shut my legs again with an unconscious gesture, as if he were folding a deck chair, and rolled me up like a ball of wool, pinning me in with my arms. I was squeezing my eyelids shut again to block out what was happening between my legs. I noticed he had summoned all his strength and he was racing along like a man on a horseback, every sinew and bone and drop of blood in his body hellbent on winning the race. I took my head in my hands and drew my limbs in tightly like a mummy. Later, I unwrapped myself and went to the local art center where I was to give a reading, I felt myself relaxing as I settled myself comfortably to read a short story. There was a woman in a village in the country who used to leave her mud brick house every morning wearing a black head cover fixed with a colored rope and a face veil which left only her eyes free. As she stepped out, she was well aware that the sight of veiled women sets hearts ablaze. Because the imagination cannot rest until it has seen the whole face. She made her way through the fields and trees, carrying an earthenware water jar on her hip, which looked like a man resting comfortably in the hollow of her waist. As soon as she got to the river, she put the jar down at the water's edge, raised her veil, and splashed water over her neck and face, then under the arms of her dress. She filled the water jar and went back, but this time she took the route through the village. She balanced the jar on her head and began swinging her hips from side to side and sticking out her breasts and moving them to the right and to the left. Buttocks, breast, buttocks, breast until the men's eyes were fastened on her and their signs followed her as she walked firmly on, saying to herself, even if you make me wear a veil and hide my face from the world, you can't hide my body. Soon afterwards, this woman married a man whose imagination wouldn't rest until he had seen the face which complemented the eyes and lashes and beautifully arched brows. This was why, when they had a daughter who was a spitting image of her mother, her father wouldn't let her hide her face behind a veil. I stopped reading and let my eyes wander over the audience. I knew my black, low-cut dress, dark eyes and skin, and Rita Hayworth's hair long rippling waves, the color of aubergines, attracted their attention more than my reading. Once I felt they were listening, I recrossed my legs, pursed my lips, made the warmth ooze from my voice and finished reading, finished reading my story. This girl refused to help her mother with the housework. When she was reprimanded, she exploded in anger. What right have you to call me lazy? If you knew what happens to me when I do housework, you would bless my disobedience, my disobedience. Every time I go up and downstairs, my breasts roll from side to side and my hips sway and I get aroused. Every time I rest against the sink to wash the dishes, the hardness of the concrete arouses me. When I knead the dough, my bottom shakes. When I bend down to scrub the floor, the sweat collects between my thighs and makes me excited. In no time at all, her excuses were making the rounds of young and old and making people toss and turn in bed. Then a young man came knocking on the door in the middle of the night asking to marry her. And the next day they were married and she bore him a daughter, as beautiful as the full moon, 
The girl grew up and followed the same path as her mother and grandmother. Besser with feelings and desires. But she made a big mistake when she found herself with her lover and wanted to spread her thighs like a leaf opening as the light touches it. I stopped reading to have a sip of water. Confident that among the audience, I had found someone who would take my face in his hands and let me lie the way I wanted to. I saw him even though my eyes had not left the page, but his eyes grazed my skin and started heating up my blood. Thank you. Emily. Okay. Um, so I have a PowerPoint uh, that is about the letters of a 10th century um, courtesan named Zad Meher. Uh, I will read my mine and Jan's translation of it at the end, but I need to put it in a little bit of context for you first. It comes from a book called Hikayat Abul Qasim, which is probably written in the 11th century. Um, it only survives in one manuscript, which is in the British Library, and that's what it looks like, um, by a man named el -Azdi that we don't know a lot about. Now, the book talks about all kinds of things. It's uh, actually a kind of microcosm. It encompasses the entire world, you might say, and revolves around the character of a party crasher. But among the many things that he talks about, are the witty, clever, beautiful, enticing um, singing girls of Baghdad. And Zad Mihir is the one he dwells on at greatest length. Seems to have been a historical character. Her, this is the name of her master, Ibn Jumhur, at the end of this long um, oops, list. He was a captive or a state secretary, a man of letters from the 10th century. In the Hikaya, he's, he's described as being, uh, and I quote, one of the stupidest, rudest people around, full of nagging, bickering, spoiledness, and tedium. In my opinion, that's because it makes her letters to him even funnier that it says that, because in another book, um, uh, another 10th century book, Kitab al about monasteries, because monasteries actually used to be a place that people would go to relax and drink wine and talk to the cute um monks i guess <laughs> um he's described there as being a kind of ple a pleasant you know well-read uh, educated um you know and a, a fun person to hang around with basically so um i think the personality of her master actually is important to understanding how her letters got preserved as we'll talk about a little later so that's why i dwell on that for a moment now, this book, Popeye and Curly, which um, was mentioned in my introduction, this is a, itself a translation of the names al Jahiz and Abu Nuwas, two of the most famous authors of medieval Baghdad, whose names literally mean the guy with the bulgy eyes and the guy with the curly lock of hair. And I developed it precisely, you know, to, be, to, to reach out to people and teach them about medieval Arabic literature in a more fun way. So uh, it's just recently been published and I'm gonna try it out on you uh, right now. So one of the anecdotes about Zadmi here in um, the monasteries, which doesn't make it into the Hikaya, uh, I have sort of translated into cartoon form here and it tells you a little bit about her relationship with her master. I'll read you my translation of it first. So Coral in this book is pretty much all the, the singing girls wrapped into one. Um, and Popeye says, guess what Coral? I've been studying the art of divination. Great, try divining what I'm thinking about now. You're thinking of a strong man with prominent eyes who loves you very much. Actually, I was thinking, don't you owe me some money? So this is a translation of, for those of you who know Arabic, you can try to piece it together. It's quite, uh, compared to my cartoon version, a little bit complex, but basically this is what happens. And it's Zad Mihir, and she's talking to her master, um, and he, he's playing at, at guessing her innermost thoughts by some sort of possibly astrological um, uh, kind, um, method. And, she actually reminds him that he promised to give her a robe 
and he hasn't done that yet at the end. So, you know, it's, I did kind of dumb it down a bit for cartoon's sake. But what it tells you about the relationship was he often seems to be quite in love with her and she's kind of making fun of him. Um, now, to what degree that was a role that they played in public to sort of entertain their guest um, and to what degree that actually reflected their dynamic, you know, that is difficult to say. Um, the, one of the first anecdotes that I translated for Selma's anthology, <laughs> I won't read you the whole thing here in the, in the interest of saving time, but in this, I'll, I'll read you the, the cartoon though. Uh, so Popeye says, we should eat before we go to the party. You know what happens when you drink on an empty stomach? I'm not hungry. And he gets all drunk and says, pretty roses. Uh-oh, says Popeye, and he's eating the roses. Someone bring him some food before you start shitting rose water jam, says the coral, says coral, the singing girl. So this is an anecdote about an anonymous slave girl in, a, in another collection by Tahiti. A very hungry man drank on an empty stomach and got so drunk that he thought the roses were dessert and started eating them. And she made this witty comment, get, get him some food before he starts shitting rose water jam. And it seems that in the Hakaya, Elazdi has attributed this story to Zadmihir. Um, possibly because she's what Ulrich Marzoff has called a crystallization character in his article, Focuses of Jocular Fiction. He actually says it in German. I still haven't looked up how to do that. Say that. Um, so the other example that I've studied a lot of this is Bunan the Party Crasher, a historical figure who did indeed crash parties in medieval Baghdad, as far as we can tell. But as time went on, he became so famous for that that stories about party crashing get attributed to him in collections. And similarly, Zadmi here seems to have been to a certain degree, a crystallization character for the clever slave woman whose beauty and intelligence gives her a kind of power. If you wanted to look at fictional examples of this, I mean, some really famous obvious ones are in the Thousand One Nights, even Shahrazad herself could be said to be this type of character. But my favorite one in the Thousand One Nights is Zumarud. Uh, if you haven't read the story of Zimarud, I highly recommend it. Um, at the in the beginning, her master um, allows her to choose who she's going to be sold to, and she chooses a beautiful young man, um, but gets kidnapped by some of the people who tried to buy her, and she insulted them, and you know they try to kidnap her and brutalize her. But because she is so clever, she manages to escape, disguises herself as a man becomes the king of a town. And in the end, after revenging herself against those who tried to harm her, um, she finds her beautiful young man that she uh, asked to buy her. And he thinks that she is the king and that he is going to have sex with him as a, a man has sex with a boy, which will, this is a theme that's gonna come back again. Um, and then at the last minute, she reveals herself to be Zimbarud and it's a happy ending. But <laughs> all kinds of interesting questions are raised in this fictional depiction about the relationship between the Jawadi, which off, who are, whose voices are very prominent in medieval Arabic literature, who, if they were highly educated and belong to a wealthy and elite social class could end up in positions of great power. And indeed, many of the mothers of Abbasid caliphs were um, slaves who were freed and became queens. So those are, you know, the, the, the exception, but shows that the idea of slavery here is a little bit different than what our modern ideas might um, lead us to believe. Now that it, it wasn't nice for all slaves, like that goes without saying. And we'll look at some historical examples at the very end and I kind of put that into context. But I think that the power dynamic that these, be these beautiful intelligent women who were valuable because they were beautiful and intelligent and obviously people, they're gonna have influence because of that. Um, and that becomes a theme in literature. Uh, about the homosexuality um, that was implied in the, the assumption that the king would want to have sex with a beautiful young man. Um, in medieval Arabic literature, the idea that uh, well, a person would want to have sex with somebody of their own gender 
for purely hedonistic reasons is extremely widespread, both men and women. It's almost treated as normal, if maybe, you know, a little naughty. For the most part, it is a hedonistic thing. I'll just re quickly read you this um, little joke from Nathar Adur, uh, The Scattering of Pearls. So, Coral, do you like pomegranates? I do, but I prefer bananas. Bananas are nice, but they tend to swell the belly. So this is a conversation between two sahaka, or women who like to grind against other women, lesbians essentially, but it's, the term has to do with the sex act. Um, and they are basically saying that they like bananas, yani penises, but because of the risk of pregnancy, they're quite happy to substitute that with, you might say a fig might be a better metaphor for female genitalia. Now that's not to say that there aren't stories about men who genuinely love men. And one of the most famous stories about love in medieval Arabic literature is between two women, Hind and Zarka. So that, that idea also did exist, but there's also just like this kind of uh, hedonistic bisexuality um, that was completely normalized. And I need to explain this all in order for you to sort of understand these letters that we're just about to dive into any moment now. Um, Winchen, do you want to? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So Brian let's Crow. Hear the Arabic first, please. Yeah. Yabna Jumhur, abatli bi nafaqatin takfini wa kiswatin turdini. Wa illa wallahi kharajtu wa ghanaytu wa qubtu bi tanni nafsi wa ashratin ma'i. وأنت تعلم أن الجارية إذا خرجت للغناء دخل سراويلها الزناء. So thank you. There's the Arabic, and you can see takfini, tardini, ghana, zana. It has a kind of rhyme to it, so it's rhyme prose. And now let me read you, if I may. Am I totally out of time? I have to read you this. And um, damn you, Ibn Jumhur, burn your eyes. You've become a sodomite, friend of slave boys with downy beards. God protect me from your wantonness. When the weaver's belly's full, he thinks his daughter a princess. By your life, I'm gonna go out and get, sing and get fucked in Basra, while your boys in Baghdad rent out their wares and you can be in the middle of Hamdun with a happy spirit. I'm not gonna judge your actions, even if you're sometimes friends with boys and sometimes women. By the life of your crooked nose, your eyeliner and your hairdo, I can compete with you blow by blow. If you get into boys, I'll take lovers. If you get into girls, I'll do some tribbing but I'll do you one better because you're never wanted unless you pay gold while I am desired and paid gold for doing it. And in the ass of the one who comes up short, a stick. May God not bless you in what you've chosen for yourself. And by the life of your dainty hairdo and your combed love locks and the elegance of your makeup on your eyes and your roomy slippers and shoes, I expect it nothing less from someone like you that you would lose interest in me. Well, I've lost interest in you. So if you fall in love, I will fall in love with someone better than you. And if you get married, I will marry someone more elegant than you. The growth of the beard marked adolescence. Oh, whoops, that's a footnote, ignore. Fie on you, O Ibn Jumhur, how quickly you forgot what you used to say to me. No sleep can satisfy me until I hold it in my hand, then I fall asleep. Or perhaps you have found one greater than it, softer, hotter, and tighter. Is that what has distracted you? Damn you, by my life, tell me the truth about it, even if the truth is something alien to you. This is just a drop from the flood of what she wrote, which seems to be true. There's a lot of letters attributed to her. Um, a few little historical examples, and that's it, to compare this to. So Fadol Shaira, um, a slave of a caliph whose job seems to have included insulting people at parties often in verse. So the fact that a slave woman might insult her master publicly in a literary style that the letters then got circulated, maybe not that strange if you think of it in that context. And then a counterexample to the kind of power that she seems to exude was an extremely talented musician and poet, but had a very cruel master who refused to sell her to Harun Rashid. So you have the mass, like the, the fact that Ibn Jumhur, maybe he wasn't as cruel as as some as some could be. And you I think they were at the mercy of whoever they got sold to. So it's, you know, that's worth bearing in mind. And Adri, she's maybe one of the most famous women in this position. And she was, she herself was a slave who owned slaves because she was um, very wealthy and a famous musician, essentially, who would train other female musicians. So a complicated picture to say the least. And it's worth bearing in mind that this almost pertains entirely to the 
the the wealthiest sort of literati um so it doesn't maybe really paint a picture of what was going on among the majority of medieval baghdadis but kind of rushed through there but thank you very much a couple of books for you to read one concerts of the caliph was already mentioned and there's another for you thank you thank you so much emily um i wish you could have read the, your whole translation yeah, sorry. I felt like I had to explain it. Maybe yeah. I should have just read it and let you wonder why. <laughs> yeah, you and Gertjan van Gelder did a fantastic job on this wonderful voice from the past. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> and um, well, I think um, we have a little bit of time, a tiny bit of time for questions. If anybody wants to put something in the chat <coughs> or raise their hand. I, I want to ask, just to kick it off, I would just like to ask you something about ac the actual ability to write. I mean, the, 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 it's very striking that they actually wrote rather than, I mean, that these letters were not, not oral letters. Hmm. Uh, do we know anything about how this skill was transmitted amongst women? That's a really great question. I mean, my impression is that if a woman showed promise, um, she could be educated in order to be, you know, sold to a wealthy buyer and her education would, would increase her worth. But I mean, I think lit um, the ability to read and write was much more common in medieval Baghdad than say medieval Europe partly because um, I think most children learn to read the Quran, for example. So I think uh, just being literate in general was a, was a more common trait. There's not much Quranic echoes in what you were reading. You'd be surprised uh, <laughs> where the Quran pops up in this book. I, I can't think of an example in her letters off the top of my head, but I'd almost be surprised if it were completely absent because it's it, it was so widespread that even in um, a very lighthearted, uh, you know, obscene sort of joke, a little phrase that everybody knew would just add a little spice to that yes. to that joke. And that was, you know, uh, well, Professor Van Hutter has written a, a, a wonderful article about that called Frivolous Firebrands on precisely that topic, which I recommend. Right. I have a question for Selma too, and for Samira. Um, I think Hanan isn't with us, but it could be for Hanan also. And that is, um, what kind of censorship or opposition have have you encountered? I don't know if I can see um, Samira. I mean, is there is there obviously this topic is very sensitive all over the world. I mean, it isn't it isn't. I'm not making a comment about. The Middle East in particular. I mean, some of the material we heard tonight, obviously, I mean, Allen Ginsberg was prosecuted for making similar comments in Howell, in his great poem Howell. I mean, they did get off, the, the beat poets, I mean, Allen Ginsberg was in the end not condemned, but it was quite a long trial for, for references to homosexuality, for example. So, Samira, et vous là? Samira, Selma, are you there? Miko, sorry, uh, oh. can you hear me now? Yes, uh, I think self censorship is the, the most difficult to deal to deal with because you 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 never uh, you never really know the limit and the limit changes all the time. As if I can give you an an example about the Algerian political system, it changes so fast and the generations changes so fast. And maybe social media added another um, another um, uh, difficulty because um, in the past you would write something that would sell for one thousand or three thousand copies to people interested uh, in poetry, but now any anyone can pick pick the poem or pick something you said and put it online and do a campaign uh, against uh, an author or against a public person. So you are in, a, um, um, let's say, uh, quickly changing societies where uh, people feel, especially young people feel they are more free, but in reality, the, the conservative part of the society is becoming more and more uh, present and violent and organized and funded. 
so I think it's uh, it's it's really changing. I, I remember writing very um, uh, kind of erotic and uh, maybe um, come on the uh, uh, provocative books when I was uh, in my twenties. I think it would be impossible to print this and to publish this in in my country now. But I I do publish. Uh, some kind of work outside the country. And I'm not sure I, I could uh, circulate them here normally. I mean, I always question myself about this. Uh, it, it is possible in, uh, in uh, small groups. Like I remember once I, I gave a reading in the French Cultural Center and the only person who attacked me then was a very uh, open-minded uh, woman. Uh, who was uh, from the Algerian TV. Like if you see her in the street, you could say, this is a very uh, open-minded girl in any Western country. But she was the only one attacking me while uh, conservative people never attacked me in public. So it's, it's difficult to give you um, like a, 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 a standard answer. It, it is it's, it is changing, and now I have the feeling in society um, oh, everything is possible, but you have to take care of yourself. Thank you very much, Selma. Do you want to comment on the sort of difficulties of that kind you had uh, putting together the book? Because I think some uh, people are under pseudonyms and things like that. Yes, I mean it was up to the writers if they wanted to use pseudonyms. I mean I think that some you know writers from any culture might on this topic just want to use a pseudonym to just feel freer. I mean it just might be that they don't want their you know their parents or their children thinking of that, <laughs> them in that way. So that wasn't necessarily specific to to the region, but obviously it is more prevalent as as a result of that. I think. Um, it's, it is, and I, I was very interested in what Samira said, because I think with social media on some levels, you feel, you know, social media and sort of online streaming and all that stuff that everything's opening, but actually it does make you, you know, very worried about where messages can go and how they're spread. So um, there has been a degree of, of, of you know, of, of caution on that. It is just published in English. We were told by Saki um, in Beirut that really, you know, to distribute it in Arabic would be pretty pretty difficult with with, with the subject matter and, and the subheading that we had at the time, which was lust and erotica. Um, so it's a concern, but it's there's also um, very difficult to gauge. I mean, it could it could shift. You know, I'm, I'm sort of taking taking the writer's lead on this and Saki, and we're you know it's constant sort of. You know sort of jostling feeling of like what can we do i agree very much about um self-censorship and i think that's a very um interesting phenomenon just not just for arab women writers but in terms of when one is writing on these subjects how one re-narrates a moment of emotional or physical intensity you know i think that we are quite inclined to just as people to sort of like write it down into one, you know, try and perfect it or block it out because the emotions are very charged. So I think that the actual act of writing this type of work is, is more challenging perhaps than other works. So that's from within and then it would be other levels like community, you know, family, community, friends, state, so, you know, so, um, yeah, it's, it's an issue, but I think it is the, the, the creativity and dealing with constraints is something that the collection celebrates. And I hope that it's received well. Um, you know, it's been reviewed in Egypt and a couple of different Arab presses are asking me to talk about it and they've been very positive so far. So, you know, hopefully things are- Excellent news, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a great achievement. Thank you. I think Wen Chin will say, but I want to thank all of you very, very much, and all of you who came as well. Wen Chin will say goodbye to us, I think. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. And Selma, Samira, um, Marina, you stepped in, Emily and Hanan. So thank you very much and thank all the guests for coming and participating. Hatian, nice seeing you and hope to see you soon. Next workshop. And thank you, Marina. <laughs>